We're looking at uh, GCSE Physics Unit 1 Higher Tier from SIA for 2016. Question 1. Olympic cyclists often train on a stationary bicycle like the one shown below. The cyclist controls the amount of friction at the rear wheel by adjusting a lever close to the hand grip. Explain what is meant by the force of friction. So that's just straight book bookwork of uh, learning a definition from your notes and friction we know is the force which opposes motion. A sensor in the rear wheel measures the acceleration of the cyclist when he pedals the bicycle. Another sensor measures the forward force with which the cyclist exerts on the machine. A cyclist maintains a constant forward force during the training session, but at various times he changes the friction at the rear wheel and notes his acceleration. Below is a table of his results. So we've got a constant force of these values, and we have an acceleration of these values. So we've got a force related to an acceleration here. Part B, uh, 1. How can you tell from the table that the acceleration is not directly proportional to the friction? So I've brought these, uh, this table forward so we can have a look at it here. So we're being asked to look and see um, how these numbers aren't proportional. Now you can see this is going up in sixes. So it's going up by a set amount. These numbers are actually going down. If these are proportional, then the acceleration should go up by a set amount. These have gone up by equal increases. We would expect the acceleration to go up by equal increases. Okay. Another way of looking at this is if these were proportional, then the ratio of one to the other would be constant, which it definitely isn't. So as friction force increases on the top line here, acceleration does not, acceleration actually decreases. Okay, or the other way to look at it is that the ratio of friction to acceleration is not constant, which it would be if they were proportional. Remember, proportional uh, is a straight line through the origin. So uh, doubling one, uh, one quantity will automatically double the value of the other quantity. So if you were to divide them, um, the ratio should stay constant, which it isn't. Okay, But the easiest way to say it here is that this one's going up, this one isn't. So it's definitely not proportional if they don't at least even follow any common trend. Part 2. In the box below, write down an equation which connects the forward force T, the friction force F, the combined mass of the cyclist on his bicycle M and the acceleration A. Now, firstly, uh, we would have to assume here that this is a cyclist riding along a road because the equation they're looking for here wouldn't really apply to the cyclist bolted down on a fixed track like this. So if we make that assumption, And we assume that there's a forward force here, backward force, here, and that uh, A points this way, and these forces are called T in the forward direction and F in the backward direction. Then we're writing Newton's second law, which is a resultant force in the direction of A equals MA. So the resultant force in the direction of A is going to be T minus F because T points in the direction of A, a and F points opposite to the direction of A. So T minus F is the resultant force in the direction of A and that's equal to MA. 
So always write the resultant force in the direction of the acceleration when you write this equation, because these are these are sort of vectors, you know, this thing has a direction, this thing has a direction. Um, and so you should be thinking about the directions of both sides when you try and put them equal to each other. Part 3 then. On the grid below, plot a graph of the friction force against the acceleration and use a ruler to draw uh, the straight line of best fit. So they're telling you that it's going to be a straight line. Uh, continue your line of best fit until it touches both axes. You will need to select a suitable scale for the vertical axis and label it appropriately. So what they've done is they've given us the acceleration uh, scale and have asked us to make up the other scale. So again we need to look at these numbers, which makes me glad now that I kept them. Uh, so we have accelerations that go all the way to 0.5 and that scale will be suitable for that, the one that they put in. We have friction force that goes all the way to 30. So we need to look at the scale here and see what will work for 30. So if we count these um, squares in order to figure that out, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, Four and a half, okay. So four and a half squares. Uh, if we were going to thirty, we could go uh, one and a half squares, one and a half squares, one and a half squares. But that would give us a really awkward scale. And you can see by what they've done that they haven't been too fussy about using the whole scale. Uh, they just made sure they crossed the halfway mark. And if we just went ten, twenty. 30, we would cross the halfway mark. And remember, that is your golden rule about a, a scale. If you've crossed the halfway mark, you're all right. If you haven't got halfway, you could have easily doubled your scale. So um, 10, 20, 30 should be fine. So I'll just check the details of this uh, grid. So it is friction in newtons. So um, that's our title. Remember that your tables transfer to your axes. So that's what we should be putting on this scale here. Okay, so let's get rid of that and put on a title. And a unit. And so now we need to plot these points. So when the friction force was 6, the acceleration was 0.5. So acceleration 0.5 is here, and we're looking to do a 6, which would be there. Uh, 0.4, we had a 12. So 0.4, and we have a 12. And 0.3, we had an 18. So that's going to be here. Uh, point 0.2, we had a 24, and that's going to be here. And uh, point 0.1, we had a 30, and that's going to be there. Now, it's very awkward with an ordinary stylus to plot accurately on the iPad, so hopefully you can do better than this. Now we need a straight line of best fit, and it needs to meet both axes. And that's your line of best fit. Part 4. From your graph, state the maximum acceleration which the cyclist could have achieved when applying this constant forward force. So we need to look at that graph. Right, so the maximum acceleration is down here when the force is all the way down to zero. So when we've got no friction, that's when we're getting the maximum acceleration. So this value here is the max acceleration. So that is 0 0.6 meters per second squared. And since that graph is accurate to a tenth, we can put an O in there as well. Because it's not 5.9 and it's not 6.1, it's 6.0. Okay, 
Part 5 then, find the constant forward force being applied by the cyclist. Right, well, if we look at this graph again, we have um, maximum A here and zero acceleration when the friction equals this value. So if you remember that the pull of the cyclist and the uh, frictional force are acting against each other, then when they equal each other, then we should get no acceleration. So what we've got here is a frictional force of like 36 newtons causing us to have no acceleration. So that means that T must equal 36. So what we can say here is that when F equals 36 newtons, A equals nothing. So uh, Newton's second law says that uh, T minus F is MA, and if A equals 0, then T minus 36 equals 0. And that must mean that T equals 36 newtons as well. Okay, so A equals naught when F equals 36, and T minus F equals MA. We had that from earlier. So T minus 36 equals naught because A times M, doesn't matter what M is, A times M is going to be naught because A equals naught. And so T minus 36 is that, therefore T must equal 36. And that makes sense because if these two forces are fighting to cause acceleration, when they balance you won't get any acceleration. Okay, the combined mass of the cyclist on his bicycle is equal to the size of the gradient of the graph. Ignore the fact that the gradient is negative. Calculate the combined mass of the cyclist and his bicycle. You're advised to show clearly how you get your answer. So this will be about, um, you know, drawing a rise and run triangle on your graph. So let's bring the graph in again. Well, to be honest, um, it's going through some nice round numbers here. It goes through 36 here, and it goes through exactly 0 0.6 here. So here we have a rise. It's actually a fall. So it's a rise of minus 36 over a run of 0 0.6. And so you would add those in to your graph or draw a triangle if you can't find these points nice and round numbers here. So add to your graph the fact that you've got a rise value here and a run value here and then take those into your calculation. Part C, a car collides with a tree. From the damage caused and inspection of the collision, police make the following measurements. That the force exerted by the tree on the car in newtons is 12,000 newtons. That the duration of the collision is 2 seconds and that the mass of the car is 800 kilograms. Now that value of 800 kilograms seems a bit low for the car in the picture, but maybe they couldn't get the right picture. Two seconds seems very long for a collision with a tree, but we'll just work with the numbers that are there. It does seem a bit odd that banging into a tree took two whole seconds. But <clears throat> we have a force and we have a mass uh, and we have a duration of time, so we should be able to find out things that we are needing to find out here. So the car hits the tree, and these are the numbers, what do we do? 
Well, we use that two seconds in conjunction with the other information. It says here, calculate the deceleration of the car when it hits the tree, and you're advised to show clearly how you get your answer. So, we have a car that goes from a uh, a value of moving to a value of no speed over a time. Uh, we also have a force and a mass and accelerations can be got by A is equal to F over M. So from Newton's second law it's possible for us to write an expression for the acceleration that A is F over M. So F over M, 12,000 over 800, gives us 15 metres per second squared for the deceleration. OK, calculate the speed of the car just before it hits the tree. You're advised to show clearly how you get your answer, OK? So what we've got here is a collision, like a UVAST collision. So if we list what we know, U is an unknown, V is zero, because it finishes hitting the tree, it stops. A is going to be minus 15 meters per second squared. And the time for the collision is 2 seconds. So this is easy. This is going to be V equals U plus AT. And uh, since we want U on its own, U is going to be V minus AT. And what we need to do now is fill this in. So we've got 0 for V. And then we're subtracting negative 15 times 2 for AT. And so the minus of minus 15 times 2 is going to be plus 30. And that will be in metres per second. Uh, just ignore my use of these um, oddball units. It should be meters per second squared with a slash and meters per second with a slash, sorry. Um, I'm not meant to use that at GCSE. And that is the end of question one.